Hello, welcome to another episode of This, That, and the Other. Thanksgiving will, will be upon us next week, and you got the Thanksgiving football games that are always popular on Thanksgiving. It used to be two, now there's, now there's a third one. Well, the last time I discussed the history of the NFL, and I'm going to break down the history and go from 1920, at least from 1920 to 1930. I may go beyond that. I've just been reading the paragraphs, on or the articles on the breakdowns on the, um, ninth, the seasons going from 1920 on. That was the first year the NF, NFL came into existence. It was actually called um, the um, AP, APFL. And I'm going to go ahead and read a little information on what I got out of the um, official NFL encyclopedia. And pro football had been in existence for 28 years since... Hodge Heffelfinger played for the Allegheny Athletic Association for $500 in 1892. There was a need for a regulated league. There, they had problems with teams every, every year. Better, better players would be sought out by other owners. Other owners would offer a, a player more money to go play for his team, make his team better. There was all, 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 a lot of that going on. There was also um, college players that were playing college football on um, Saturday and then under an assumed name and then playing in a pro on a pro team on Sunday and, and they wanted to get a league started to put an end to all that kind of stuff. Um, increasing salaries threatened to bankrupt clubs. That that was um salary cap was needed. The use of college players still in school, that was another another reason they wanted like I just said. A serious attempt to form a league failed in Ohio in nineteen oh four. Uh Second attempt, I'm going to read this paragraph, to form a league was initiated in 1920. On August 20th, representatives from four teams met in offices of Ralph Hay, the business manager of the reigning professional champions of Canton Bulldogs. At the meeting, Hay and Jim Thorpe represented Canton, Fred Not Frank Nide and Arthur Ranney, the Akron Pros, Carl Stork, the Dayton Triangles, and Jimmy O'Donnell and Stanley Kofal of the Cleveland Indians. American Professional Football Conference was formed. That's what it was called before Before it was called the NFL. Charter members were Buffalo, Rochester, and Hammond, Indiana. The members of the APFC, I'm going to be reading another, another few paragraphs because it's too hard to break down this information. That's inf everything that's in this paragraph is pretty pertinent to the, to the year 1920. The members of the APFC had hoped that F.J. Griffiths, the vice president and general manager of the Central Steel Company, would back the Massillon Tigers and enter the team into a new league. However, Griffiths declined, thereby withdrawing Massillon from the sport for the season. Because Canton Massillon games had generated the greatest fan interest in pro football, Hay, who was appointed temporary secretary, kept prospective dates on the schedule open for the Tigers, who would be replaced by the Hammond team should Massillon indeed not play. A second meeting was scheduled for September 17th, and Hay invited a large number of teams to attend, many of which, including Buffalo's entry, did not show up. Ten teams did. Akron, Canton, Cleveland, Dayton, Hammond, Rochester, Decatur, Illinois, Staley's with George Hallis and Morgan O'Brien representing A.E. Staley's interests, the Muncie, Indiana Flyers, represented by Earl Ball. The Racing Cardinals, represented by painting and decorating contractor Chris O'Brien, who had run the team since 1899. And the Rock Island, Illinois Independents, represented by manager Walter Flanagan. There was some confusion about the Cardinals, who were named for Racing Avenue in South Chicago, rather than for Racing Wisconsin, was assumed when a record was made of the teams that were, were present. Again, Maslon didn't send a representative to the meeting. However, Vernon Mac McInnes, an Akron promoter, attempted to obtain a franchise named the Maslon Tigers. McInnes intended for his club to be a traveling team, playing its entire schedule on the road. However, the plan for a Maslon team, backed by outside financing and really having nothing to do with Maslon, was not viewed favorably by the member clubs who didn't allow McGinnis as representative into the meeting. Instead, Hay spoke for Massillon and said that, that the team would not operate, that the city would not operate a team in 1920. Hay operated a 
Hupmobile automobile dealership and the meeting was held in his showroom. There were not enough chairs in the room and some of the representatives of the clubs had to sit on the running boards and fenders of the automobiles. Jim Thorpe was an elected the neat league, league president, Stanley Kofall, vice president, Art Ranney, secretary treasurer, and A.E. Young, chairman of the rules committee. A $100 membership for, per team was charged, which none of the teams paid. Three more charter members, the Detroit Heralds, Columbus Panhandles, and Chicago Tigers emerged. The, they didn't keep standings back then. Um, the championship was determined by the one lost record. They didn't they didn't have championship games yet. September twenty sixth, the first game was played at Rock Islands, Douglas Park, eight hundred in attendance. The Independence beat St. Paul's Ideals, the St. Paul Ideals forty eight to nothing in a rainstorm. Um, one one note about about that. Um, one of the the salary cast the salaries were getting bigger, players were wanting more money, other owners were offering more money and the problem is that the teams couldn't generate the money because of the lack of of space for fans at, at the games, stadiums would be full, but the they were small. The stadiums were small, and not not like you know t- today's stadiums. The first APBF, APFA match was the Dayton Triangles beating the Columbus Panhandles fourteen to nothing on the same day. Rock Island beat Muncie forty five to nothing. They scored three touchdowns from block punts in the first quarter. Hallis canceled the game against Muncie because of their poor performance the next week, and the team's financial backers pulled out, and Muncie folded. They only they only played one game that year, and already folded. Racine changed to the Chicago Cardinals by early in the in the season. I'm trying to find this paragraph that I I marked that has the information on it. Yeah, by early in the season, the Racing Cardinals generally had come to be known as the Chicago Cardinals. On November 7th, Patty Driscoll ran 40 yards for a touchdown to lead the Cardinals to a 6-3 victory over the Chicago Tigers. Legend has it that the Cardinals owner, Chris O'Brien, had bet the APFA franchise rights to Chicago on the game, with the loser being forced to fold. Indeed, at the end of the season, the Tigers did just that, but the story is still questionable. In 1920, the APFA didn't have the kind of franchise rights that existed later. In addition, the newspapers of the day made it clear that the game was for the Pro Championship of Chicago, a title with more prestige than rights to anything in the little-known AP, APFA. The Cardinals' victory certainly helped push the Cardinals in, or the Tigers into oblivion. Before the game, most of the city newspaper coverage had gone to the Tigers. After the Cardinals' run, they surpassed the Tigers in both media attention and attendance. The dwindling attendance and expensive roster forced the Tigers to fold because they lost too much money. There were four, four. There was a four-team playoff between Ak- and the teams were Akron, Buffalo, Canton, and Decatur. Buffalo won, beat Canton seven to three, and Buffalo then took on Akron, and and that game ended in a scoreless tie. Uh, it was a there was rain and. It was, a combination of rain and snow in that game. The Staley's um, claimed state claim with with a win over the Cardinals, the Chicago Cardinals, but and then they had um, ended up having Akron, who was undefeated, take on the Staley's, and the game ended in a scoreless tie. Akron not only finished the season undefeated, the team also made history by having Fritz Poller as its co-coach, along with L.G. Tobin. Although it hardly was noted at the time, Pollard was the first black coach in the NFL. Only in later years was much made of that fact, and an effort made to ascertain the rule Pollard played in the handling of the team. While most of the teams in the APFA realized that their most important goal to survive through 1920, the season wasn't totally successful. Salaries had continued to rise. Players still jumped from team to team, and some teams had continued to use college players. So, what they were trying to what they were trying to change really didn't make that much of a difference in in, ni- in 1920. Um, I was going to go ahead and read um, who the teams were in 1920 and the 1920 standings. Uh, the Akron Pros were eight no eight eight wins, zero losses, three ties. Decatur Staley's. 10, 1, and 2, Buffalo All-Americans, 9, 1, and 1, the Chicago Cardinals, 6, 2, and 2, 
Rock Island Independent, 6-2-2. Two two. Dayton Triangles, 5-2-2. Two two. Rochester Jefferson, 6-3-2. Canton Bulldog, Bulldogs, 7-4-2. Um, these, and the rest of these teams play had shorter seasons. Um, Detroit Herald, Heralds were 2-3-3. Two, three, three. The Cleveland Tigers were 2-4-2. Two, two. The Chicago Tigers were 2-5-1. Hammond Pros, 2-5-0. The Columbus Panhandles were 2-6-2. Two, and, two, and the Muncie Flyers were 0-1. And one. Uh, that's how the 1920 season went. Um, next, next show, I'm going to be discussing the 1921 season, probably going all the way to 1930 at least. As always, thanks for watching.